Amen and good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. And the peace of Christ be with you all. And let us greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And let us join in a moment of prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for gathering us here to worship you on this day. And Lord, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Bless us with your spirit and with your power on this day. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And now we have a couple of announcements, so you can come forward at this time if you have an announcement to make. I will make uh, just two announcements for you. I know I'm going to make a couple announcements for you. Okay, so a couple of announcements for you. So the first one is this morning at 9 a.m. We did not have David or Bethany with us. We had Sarah uh, Hanley Cousins and Sarah Roberts fill in. They did a wonderful job. But the reason that we did not have David and Bethany here is because they welcomed a new baby girl into the family, baby Aria who is healthy and happy and eight pounds and cute little chunky cheeks so she looks wonderful and so we are celebrating with them and praying with them by the way this is the third baby that david has had since he's been here in this church and it's the first time he's taken a sunday off after having a baby so we're very proud of him that he finally took a sunday off a well-deserved sunday off and my next announcement is that if you saw in the email, sadly, we were so excited to be able to host the Kenyan Children's Choir, and we will get to host them next year. But unfortunately, the government was super slow. Their government was really slow with like their visa process and everything, and which, of course, is not a surprise. And they had been trying to get their visa appointment forever, and finally they were given their appointment, and it's not until January. So that means this year is out, but they will be able to get their appointment in January for their visas, and hopefully plan some point in time for 2023 and I said we are ready for you whenever you can come we are ready and we are excited to host you so that's my next announcement and then I do just want to share where Kaylee's going to make a video announcement for us because she is away this weekend for the retreat in just a moment but we do have our trunk or treat coming up we have 18 cars 19 cars signed up so far so it's going to be fun uh, so tell all the kids in the neighborhood that you want to come do the trunk or treat if you want to sign up do it we're going to have some fun Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I ask permission. Um, we'd like to congratulate Joey and Taylor Peacock on Woo! their wedding. <laughs> Congratulations. I taught Joey in Sunday school when he was in fifth grade. <laughs> oh, he'll always, uh, yeah, he'll always be Joey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my other announcement, uh, my children both belong to Grace Church on Eggert Road, and they asked me if I would announce this announcement. They're sponsoring a blessing closet over at the church. It's a free giveaway of new and gently used clothes, shoes, and books for all ages. It's going to be from 9 to 1, October 15th, next Saturday. So feel free to go over there. They have a lot of clothes, toys, or not toys, books and shoes. So please feel free to go over. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you didn't hear my knee creak up here. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm here to share the good news with you on the meat raffle. So, but first I'd like to thank everybody that was part of this. Mm -hmm. It was the committee. Uh, the PB and J's, and also all the volunteers that helped out for everybody that attended, um, particularly John Pauling for mm -hmm. heading this committee. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for him. So, anyways, the we had 225 attendees, and the total profit made was three thousand four hundred seventy dollars. So that was great news for the church. It was very good. Um, the youth group also had a concession stand in the back. They made $95. I have a feeling they ate a lot of their profits first. So. Um, anyways, but thank you so much for making this a success for us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You'll notice that you haven't seen me very much. <laughs> uh, I have a problem that I'd just like to share with all of you. I live in Lackawanna. Uh, I, I do not have a driver's license anymore, so I can't drive to get here. Uh, 
I am making an offer. Anybody that wants to volunteer to give the ride on any Sunday, I'll pay you ten dollars to give you a ride. So please, please check and see if there's anybody that you know that might say yes. I'll I'll help you out. Yes. Ah, oh, good. <laughs> We'll get you here. Yes, thank you, Eugene. Yeah. And let's go. All right. And now let us gather in a moment of prayer as we light our peace candle. Holy and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for allowing us to worship you. And Lord, we ask that you teach us your peace. Teach us ways of your peace and help us to follow your peace. Help us to be instruments of your peace in this world. Let us create peace in our lives, in our communities, and in this world. And we pray this all through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, the Prince of Peace. And together we say, Amen. <laughs> And as it turns out, I skipped Kaylee's video announcement, so we're going to go back to that one and hear her announcement. Good morning. On October 23rd, it just so happens that there is not a Bills game, which means that following our church service, the best place to be is the Fatima Shrine for our fall retreat. This is a great way to connect with God and others, exploring rest, renewal, creativity, and there is some very beautiful indoor and outdoor scenery. The rest will have to be a surprise. Oh, and the cafeteria has some really great food. If you're interested, go to zionuccton.com slash retreat, or you can email me at my first and last name, kayleemelke at gmail.com. And you could always let me know the day of the retreat also. All right, bye everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Will you please join me in the opening litany? Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing glory to God. Give God glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you. Sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. God turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of God's praise be heard. Come in here, and I will tell you all God has done. Let us worship.
Amen. And you may open up your pew Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 29. We will read the first 14 verses. Now, Jeremiah chapter 29 is definitely the most popular of the chapters from the prophetic book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the major prophetic books, and it's a, a book that is known by many. However, the only verse that's often recited is one of the verses that we are going to read today. But I want you to know that Jeremiah actually has a nickname, and his nickname is the Weeping Prophet. And Jeremiah is a prophet who's not usually very flowery with his words. He can come down pretty hard on the people. And he, he can, if you read through the book of Jeremiah, you will see why he's called the Weeping Prophet. But this one verse is the verse that's repeated time after time, and we're going to talk about this verse. But I want us to also understand not just that one verse, but the verses around it and the whole entire context around it. So that's what we're going to do today. So you can open up to Jeremiah chapter 29, starting with verse 1, reading through verse 14. It's page 717 in your pew Bibles. Or if you have a large print, it's in the Old Testament, page 963. And if you are ready to hear the word of the Lord, will you please say amen? Amen starting with verse 1. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priest and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconi and the queen mother and the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand and of Elisha, son of Shaphan, the, and Germiah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar, or sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it said, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, the people were in exile at this time, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, said the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. And then when you call upon me and when you pray to me, I will hear you. And when you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir. And let us join in a moment of prayer. Holy and loving God, as we come here to worship you, to sing your praises and to worship you, we ask that you bless the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our minds, that all that we do and all that we say can be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So who here has heard that verse, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11? Give me a little wave of the hand if you've heard that verse before, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It's a verse that's known by many, that's recited by many. You probably bought a couple graduation cards with that verse on it, maybe some graduation gifts with that verse on it, for I know the plans I have for you. We always put that on so many different graduation gifts. It's also a verse that maybe you've had somebody recite to you or maybe you've said to yourself, if you've hit a bump in the road, you know, something happens, maybe a bump in your career, maybe a bump in your personal life, and you hit a little bump and somebody says, well, just know for surely God knows the plans that God has for you. It's one of those verses that you'll find in, in cards and in inspirational things when somebody's maybe feeling a little bit of pain in their life and somebody shares that verse with them. This is a powerful verse and it is a beautiful verse. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. But here's the catch. Anybody ready for the catch here? Here is the catch. So often this verse, I'll say, is kind of thrown around. People put it on graduation cards. They put it everywhere. They put it there to comfort people. This verse is so often just thrown around. But if we don't understand the meaning behind the verse, we really actually miss out on the verse's power, on this power that we can find right here. Because this isn't just some fluffy verse that we're supposed to hand around and write on every kind of graduation card. Believe it or not, this isn't meant to be some fluffy verse. Jeremiah, by the way, wasn't a very fluffy kind of prophet. He was known as the weeping prophet. He was not one to give those, those fluffy, feel-good feelings to people. That was not what he did. Most of the prophets did not do that, at least not prophets who were trying to really teach the people how they could do better. So this wasn't just meant to be some fluffy verse that would be written on graduation cards. That was not the purpose of why Jeremiah the prophet said this verse and wrote this verse to the people who were in exile. But instead, Jeremiah wrote this verse and this letter in a letter that went to the people who were in exile, to the Israelite people who had been ripped away from their homes and sent into Babylonian exile, sent away from all that they had known, sent away from all that they had cared about. They were sent away into exile, torn out of their homes and sent away to live in exile with no end in sight. And Jeremiah writes to the people, and here at this part, he's giving them hope. But the thing is, it's not immediate hope. Did you catch a year, a fr something about a year, a time span that we caught when we were reading? Anybody catch anything? 70. Wow. Good job, people. Whoo. I'm, I'm really impressed by that. You guys kind of paid attention to that. Because I didn't tell anybody to pay attention to that. But Jeremiah says, after 70 years in exile, 70 years. After 70 years in exile, he says, then God will bring you home. After 70 years living in a place that's not your home, then God will bring you home. After 70 years of living a life that is not the life that you wanted and that you envisioned for yourself, then God will bring you and your family home. Then there will peace, be peace. Then there will be hope. So Jeremiah is writing to the people and he's saying, don't give up. Have families. Get married, have babies. We love church babies, by the way. No pressure yet, but we love church babies. But, you know, get married and have, and have babies and, and give your, your children in marriage and have them have babies and create lives for one another. Create families. Live the life that you want to live. Build that life. Don't give up all hope, but instead build that life knowing that after 70 years of exile, then God will bring you back to your home. The prophet Jeremiah is saying, don't give up hope because eventually when these 70 
70 years is over, then you and your families can come back home. These were words of promise. These were words of comfort. But here's the thing that we need to understand. This was not a blanket promise. Now, do you guys know what a blanket promise? When we talk about God making promises, sometimes we say something's a blanket promise. It's something, if I make you a blanket promise right now, if I say, I promise to do X, Y, and Z for you, and it's a blanket promise, that means no matter what you do, no matter what you do, I'm going to uphold to my end of the promise. You can do something really bad or, or really terrible, but I'm still going to uphold my end of the promise. That's what a blanket promise is. Like, I promise to make a promise that I'm going to do something for you, and you don't have to do anything at all. That's what a blanket promise is. This is not a blanket promise promise. So here is the catch with this verse. And this is kind of my hiccup. People recite this verse a lot. And I'm always like, well, well, yeah, but did you read the next verse? It's the thing pastors often pay attention. I can see a little look on Pastor Pierre's face here. You know, sometimes when somebody focuses on one verse and it's like, well, yeah, yeah, but, but did, you read, did you read what came after it? Did you read the verses that came after it? Let's look at what the verses are that came after it. This is why this is not a blanket promise. Because yes, God says for surely I know the plans for you to give you a future and hope. God says that. That's God's end of the promise. But look at what it says in the verses to follow. Then when you call upon me, when you come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. God is saying, when you search for me, when you pray to me, when you call out to me, then I will be there for you. Because this is not a blanket promise, but instead this is a covenantal promise. This is a covenantal promise similar to when Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Jesus doesn't just say, it's going to be given to you. Jesus doesn't just say, you're going to find it. Jesus doesn't just say, oh, the door is going to be open to you. But Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Well, that's actually what the prophet of Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah is saying, yes, God promises this wonderful stuff right here. Yes, God promises that God will give you a future and a hope. But you need to end, uphold your end of the promise. And your end of the promise is right here to call upon God, to come and to pray to God, to search for God, to seek God, and to, to seek God with all your heart. Now, if you think about it, this is a covenantal promise. So uh, how many of you here have been married? Some kind of recently. How many of you guys are married? So if you've been married in your life, then, then you've made a covenantal promise with somebody because you realize a marriage is a covenantal promise. Now, sometimes when, when couples come to me and they want to write their own vows, you guys know this, I just told you this a little while ago, and I say, that's fine. If you want to write your vows, just make sure you're actually vowing something to, someone, uh, to one another. Don't just say, oh, I love you. You're wonderful. You're so beautiful. You're amazing. You make me feel so good. It's like, oh, those are really nice nice words, but you're not promising anything to one another. When you get married, you're supposed to make a covenantal promise, a covenantal vow, because one person says, I'm going to love you till death do us part, and the other person says, yep, me too, I'm going to love you till death do us part, where, you know, through the good and the bad, all that kind of stuff, I'm going to love you, and that's a covenantal promise, where the two are making a promise to one another. What Jeremiah is saying that God is doing right here, this is also a covenantal promise, where God is saying, I will be there for you, and I will help you to fulfill your plans. I have a plan for you, and I will make sure it's a good plan. But in order for that to be a covenantal relationship, God's saying, I need you to search for me. I need you to find me. I need you to pray for me or pray to me. I need you to be in a relationship with me as well. God is a covenantal God, and God makes a covenantal promise with us, not unlike a marriage. God is making a promise to us, and if we uphold our end of the promise, then God says that God will uphold God's end of the promise as well because God will do the guiding if we do the praying and the searching and the asking. I once had somebody come to me. Honestly, I've actually had a few people come to me, and they've been like, you know, they've come up to me, and they've been like, Pastor, like, why doesn't God just do this for me? 
Why doesn't God just find me the man of my dreams? Why doesn't God just bring the man of my dreams to my doorstep? By the way, I do have one friend that God literally brought the man of her dreams to her doorstep. He was a delivery guy, and yes, they got married. However, she was a very, 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 or is a very, very faithful woman. And so she asked and she received, but again, faithful woman. But so often people who are not necessarily super faithful, they'll be like, well, why doesn't God just do this for me? Why doesn't God just fix this in my life? Why doesn't God just do this? Sometimes I look at the people and I'm like, well, and they don't like it when I say this. I don't like saying this, but sometimes I'm like, well, what are you doing for God? Are you searching for God? Are you praying to God? Are you worshiping God? Are you living out God's covenant? Are you loving others as you love yourself? Are you upholding that end of the promise? And sometimes people look at me and as I said, they don't usually like when I say that because that's not what they want to hear because people often want to take. They're, they're like, God, just give me this. Give me this life. Give me this promise. Give me what I want. Give me, give me, give me. People can be so big at the give me, can't they? They are like, give me this, God. But they're not willing to uphold their end of the covenant promise. So sometimes people come to me and I'm like, well, well, are you upholding your end of the bargain? Are you praying? Are you worshiping? Are you being a part of this covenantal relationship with God? Or do you just want to take and take and take and take? Now, the other day I was running on the treadmill because I, I'm one of those really weird people and I prefer to run on the treadmill over running outside. I don't know what's wrong with me. I confess I have no idea what's wrong with me. I used to love running outside, but somehow the older I get, the, the more I really like running on my treadmill. And like just about every other almost 40-year-old mother out there, I have a slight addiction to Peloton. And it's, I think it's a healthy addiction, right? It keeps me healthy. And so I like it because I get on my treadmill. And then if you don't know what Peloton is, it's like these instructors that tell you what to do. And so I apparently really like working out if somebody's going to tell me what to do. Like, I don't want to think about it. I want somebody to tell me what to do. So the other day, I'm running on the treadmill. And there I am running on the treadmill. And I'm, I'm watching the TV in front of me. And the instructor's telling me what to do, telling me to go faster, telling me to go slower. I'm happy as can be. But it wasn't just a normal workout like that. There's actually, you guys know the act. Ashton Kutcher from that 70s show. Well, he's been on, on the Peloton treadmill lately because he's running a, a marathon and he's raising money for his nonprofit that's actually working to stop the sexual exploitation of children. So, I mean, that's good. And so I'm running on the treadmill and I'm listening to Ashton Kutcher, who's also running on the treadmill, and Adrian, the trainer, who's also running on the treadmill. I'm demonstrating to you guys how I run here. And so we're all running on the treadmill and they're on the TV talking to one another and I'm just running on the treadmill, listening, bumping up the speed, turning down the speed, doing whatever it is they tell me to do. And then they start to have a really interesting conversation. And they have this conversation as these verses are in my head. These are the verses that I'm thinking about and that I'm running on the treadmill just the other day. And they start talking about something. They start talking about something that's called manifesting or manifestation. Has anybody here heard about the phrase manifestation? I see some yep heads yeah, in hands. So I'll tell you, for those of you who have no idea what manifestation is, so the idea of manifestation, it's this really common, like, cliche kind of thing. It's this thing that's all super popular now where people are saying, well, you can manifest it and it will happen. What they're saying is, is if you visualize something, if you dream of something, then it will happen. You know, if you dream hard enough or you, if you envision something hard enough, then what you want to happen will, in fact, happen. But these two guys who are running on their treadmill, and they're talking back and forth. And they brought up a really good point, which goes so perfectly with this. They said the problem is, is that so many people want to manifest something in their life, but they're not willing to do the work. People want to manifest something. They want to dream about something. They don't want to envision something, but they don't want to do the work. Can somebody run a marathon if they're not going to train for a marathon? Absolutely not. You're not going to make it 26.2 miles if you don't follow a training plan. I run five days a week, and I'm not going to run a marathon and succeed if I don't do a training plan. That's not how it works. And so he's saying so often people, they they think, well, I'm just going to manifest it. I'm going to dream it, and it's going to happen. But they don't put in the work, and then they wonder why their dream doesn't come true. Or think about somebody who wants to manifest, you know, growing in their career and, and getting promoted in their career. And so they're manifesting their dreaming being the head honcho at their their firm or their business or whatever it is but while they're at work they spend all of their time gabbing with their colleagues <laughs> instead of doing the work they're not doing the work 
That idea of manifestation isn't going to do anything because if we want to fill our dreams, if we want to fulfill our goals, if we want to fulfill our visions, believe it or not, we actually have to hold up our end of the bargain. We actually have to put in the work. And that's that same idea of what the prophet Jeremiah is saying here. Jeremiah is saying, yes, God has plans for you. And this, I don't even think just applies to the Israelite people, but I I think it applies to all of God's people. Yes, God has plans for you. Yes, God wants you to have a future with hope. Yes, God wants all of that. But in order for all of this to happen first, you also need to come to God and and pray to God and search for God and seek God with all of your heart. This isn't a blanket promise. It's a covenantal promise. So I know I'm always totally preaching to the choir when I preach this kind of sermon. Because you guys are here. You're praying. You're searching. I'm pretty sure you guys are doing the best job you can to live your life the way that Christ wants you to live your life. I think, I, I think you guys are doing a pretty good job. I hope you guys are doing a pretty good job. But maybe we need to share this wisdom with somebody else in our life. Maybe we have somebody who's coming to us and they're like, you know, they're not coming to me as the pastor because they might not go to church. But maybe they're coming to you. And they're saying, you know what, Dave? I really want God just to give me this thing that I'm dreaming for. That I've been dreaming of. Why doesn't God just give this to me? Sometimes we have to turn around and we'll say, how much are you seeking God? And is this something you want or is it something that God wants for you? How much are we seeking God? Maybe when people come to you and they're like, well, God, why doesn't God just do this for me? And Barb's got to say, well... Yeah, Barb, you right there. Barb's got to say, well, are you really asking for God's guidance? Are you following where God is leading you? People might not like when we say these kind of things because they just want to ask and receive. They just want to, you know, God to just give them what they want. Sometimes we have to make sure, are you really following God? Are you searching for God? Are you seeking God? Are you seeking God with your whole heart? Because when we seek God with our whole heart, then God has a way of making things happen. I mean, I told you, I I did have a friend that prayed, God, will you just bring the man of my dreams to my doorstep? Next thing she knows, there's a UPS driver at her door (laughs) who is now her husband and the father of her adorable twin boys. (laughs) Sometimes it happens. But I'm going to tell you, she's one of the most faithful people I know who does everything she can to live her life and to share the love of God through the best of her abilities. Let's join in a moment of prayer. Holy and loving God, so often we want to take things from you and we want you to to give things to us, but we aren't willing to hold up our end of the bargain. So we come to you, Lord, faithful people who are willing to seek you, who are willing to follow you. May we follow you and may, we, may you lead us in the path that you have for our lives. Not our own path, but the path that you have for our lives. And Lord, when we impo- encounter people in our lives, people who, who want, to, want something from you, can we help to guide them so that they can follow you more faithfully? So that then you can guide them in their lives. Lord, we thank you for being a covenantal God. We thank you for having a relationship with us, your people. We thank you for allowing us to follow you. We thank you for allowing us to find you when we seek you. And now, Lord, we ask that you're always with us, always guiding us, and always helping us to stay faithful. And we pray this in every prayer through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, dear friends, it is time to continue our worship with our tithes and offerings. Let us pray together. Gracious God, may this act of giving transform our hearts and our minds. May you bless these gifts and use them to do your will. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
Now go forth with the blessing of God. Go forth with the love of Christ. Go forth in a covenantal relationship with God. Be blessed and be a blessing to all.